Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome Hi. to our seminar Hi. here. Um, this is Tasneem Jaffer on my right, Tasneem, and Sibbalji on my left. Jeff Jarvitz, Associate Professor at the University of Cape Town. I'm the Principal Investigator for this particular project on, on researching MOOC takers in Africa. We're going to be sharing the slides with you as I proceed. We, we have been working on a set of, on developing a set of MOOCs for the five years. Um, it began five years ago, and we've had about 12 MOOCs produced. You'll have a chance to just look at some of those in a minute. Uh, but in the research project, we decided to look at what is the experience of people who take MOOCs, uh, particularly the, those who are situated in Africa. There hasn't been much in the literature of focusing on MOOC takers. Uh, we decided to focus on Africa. Our, our, we'll go through a little bit about the kind of methodological issues we had, um, then an analysis of the data that we collected, and then finally um, we'll present a little bit of the findings. When we looked at um, MOOC takers in Africa, we had to try and find a way to collect a set of people who had completed our MOOCs. And we chose to focus on three areas in, in the various research papers and studies that we've been doing. Just trying to understand the challenges faced by people studying online and that focus on the access element. Currently, we're working on understanding um, the uses and the value that, that MOOC um, takers have achieved uh, in their completion of the MOOCs. And also, we've been looking at what are the transitions people use MOOCs for to move in and out of work. Those have been the three areas that we have focused on um, in Years since we have been doing the research on, on the MOOCs that we've produced. The main question that we focused on is currently, um, the research has been divided into two parts. The first part looked, in, looked at MOOC takers in Africa, and the second part has been looking at MOOC takers in South Africa, specifically students. Further on, we'll be moving into focusing on students here at UCT, where we are based. I'd like to understand how do they use the, their experience of MOOCs and online courses to support their life transitioning in and out of, of learning spaces and their workspaces. Currently, we've, we have a particular focus on the values that the users are obtaining from, from their experience of, of completing the MOOCs. We wanted, to use, we wanted to use this research to have a better understanding of the lived experience of learners, and then that would obviously help us in the design and development of our online MOOCs but also to, to make up the gap in, in empirical research about MOOC takers in Africa. This information we're hoping to use to share with universities um, who are in the process of developing online or, 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 or offering online or open courses. Okay, the project, oh, should I, should I hand over cool. to Tasneem to continue? Yeah. I'll here. take over here, yeah, but they will jump in at certain points as I'm talking. So this is a three-year project, and at the moment we about, I think we're in second, the second year. Um, we followed an opportunist, opportunist. <laughs> sorry, opportunistic data collection. So because we, our, our courses are hosted on external platforms like the Surya and FutureLearn, um, we have to contact them, contact them to get access to the data. So it was quite a process to get um, emails of course completers. And once we achieved that, we used surveys to identify who to interview. Um, once we collected that information, we contacted people and we had about 30 minutes semi-structured interviews with people. 
um, all those interviews were audio recorded, transcribed, and checked um, and anonymized. So there were various challenges with interviews, especially because we um, were doing interviews with African learners. So challenges included connectivity, data costs, scheduling, um, the interviews, and then the audio quality. So in terms of um, course completers, we had about 4,000 course completers globally. Uh, and um, in terms of the st stats, UCD courses has a, has a much bigger percentage of African, African completers in comparison to, for example, Coursera's average of 5%. So um, our interview stats, I don't know what's doing that. Our interview stats, we have 53% female. We've covered 14 African countries with 68% South African. Um, the largest group were employed and aged between 25 and 44. Um, this is quite on par with the stats globally of MOOCs who are um, people with degrees already and are in the age group of 25 and above. Um, 39 of the 59 interviewed courses um, were one of, the, one of the three of these courses, Becoming a Change Maker, Understanding Clinical Research, and Climate Change Mitigation. So I'll show you this in the next slide. But we had a portfolio of 18 courses. And our surveys were open to all the people who have done any of these courses, but given um, when these courses were released and which data we had access to, most of our data skewed to three courses, climate change mitigation, clinical research, and becoming a change maker. And then the other courses that have stars in them were um, courses we also got data from, data analysis. So, can you click? Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks, Tessie. Okay, um, I just want to say before I carry on um, that we can't see the chat because we're sharing the screen. So I've asked Jakob to just keep an eye on chat so we won't be able to answer questions as we go along. Um, but please do pop in questions into the chat. So um, we have um, a very rich data set. We have um, uh, almost 60 interviews. I think it's 58 or 59. And um, what we did in terms of analyzing the data, so we have a team of um, six people here. So um, Tasneem and Jeff are part of the team, and we also have my colleagues, Andrew Deacon, and Janet Small, and um, our researcher, Soraya Lester. Um, and so there's effectively five or six people in this team. So one of the challenges has been around um, you know, collaborative research and coming to agreements around how to code. And I think it's worth just um, mentioning here a little bit about the process that we've been to because it kind of informs the, the, the way that we see the research and the research process. But anyway, we, once we had, um, we had done the interviews um, and they'd gone for transcription, um, what we did is we had to really decide how we were going to code them. And we had our research questions, which is really around um, transitions of students going in and out of work and also around values and um, sort of access issues. And, and those had informed the interview questions. As Tasneem said, the interviews were, there were a set, set of questions around those um, themes. And then we also had um, sort of a semi-structured interview. So people told stories. So when we were reading the interviews, there, there was a lot of um, you know, very rich data. So what we did was we, we, we went through quite an interesting process where each of us um, coded the same six interviews um, uh, before talking to each other. Um, and then we presented to each other what we thought um, was emerging around that, what themes were emerging that would inform the coding of the entire data set. And uh, over that process, which was workshop, nine themes emerged, and then we developed that into a coding schema for the data set. And those nine are there, um, sort of familiar things like challenges of um, expectations around what why people were doing MOOCs, um, attitudes um, and issues around certificates was important and came out. Uh, we had some um, coding around improvements. Then we wanted to, to understand how students were experiencing the MOOC pedagogy and the platform. Um, we also looked at time um, as an, as, um, an element um, and a lens through which we could understand and analyze the data. 
transitions was another area, what we meant by transitions. Um, value, um, which we are going to focus on in this particular presentation. And then we had a ninth code, which was around UCT. Um, and that was our own interest. This is our own institution. We were interested in why people, whether there was any um, mileage or interest in whether people were engaging with them because of the institution itself as a global south institution located in um, South Africa. You know, we were interested in what people um, uh, that were based in African countries, whether there were there was anything of interest there. So as you can see, there's quite a large thematic um, spread there. And I just wanted to, to bring that up because what we're focusing on today is really just around one lens, which is value. And this is part of a bigger project. And we are now in the process of writing up and analyzing and really making sense of this. So today um, we're going to be uh, going through um, value. So the code, there was a code book established that went, that, that went into NVivo, and then we went through coding. And then that took, um, you know, we got to the point where we had, you know, 59 coded interviews. And then we kind of looked at each other and thought it's really hard to keep that in our heads. How are we going to know and understand um, and really understand the lived experience of these individuals? And then what we developed, and this was very much Tasneem driving this process, was around personas. So we developed personas for each of the um, people um, in the data set. These by now had been anonymized um, in terms of their name, but we, uh, and then we had their name, their age, and the country in which they were based. And we developed um, data cards for each um, person or each interviewee. And that was almost like a shorthand for us to be able to start sorting in our own heads this kind of quite rich complex data set and also a way for us to to meet some of the kind of collaborative research discussions and I mean, as we know and, and we have workshopped that in terms of trying to make sense of this data so i think for us as a process that's been very interesting um, and something that um, we think has worked really well um, for getting to grips with with, with this data set okay just a quick word on the literature before we go into any of the um findings so um, I think Jeff at the beginning talked about why we were doing this. We wanted to understand more about um, the experiences of learners in Africa um, or in, based in African countries um, uh, specifically. Um, but also there was a, a particular motivation around what is it that you're asking people when you're talking about value and transition and impact. And what we found is that a lot of MOOC research is either um, quite instrumental in the sense that it's a lot of it is around dropouts and um, what we've started to call a kind of deficit model where people are trying to understand what is the problem with these learners why are they dropping out why are they and it's it's quite a kind of platform centric or institutional centric view of learners um, there are other studies that try and um, gauge students' motivations. So I've noted a study there by Watford and Barak, which is exploring why what motivates um, MOOC um, takers. You know, in terms of what is their intention, and this was around three themes that emerged in that study around personal motivation, educational and career motivations. And they align with some of our themes. But again, in that study, this was around motivation, not actually what happened once um, the, the people had been through the course. Um, there are um, studies that look at completion, so post-course surveys and what people think about the experience of the course after they've done it. And there are learner stories where there's, uh, you'll probably have seen inspirational stories of plucky learners. But we felt that what we were not getting is what were, was it possible to gauge any kind of longer term impacts on um, people taking MOOCs? Um, and this is very difficult because it's partly as Tasteem talked about earlier, it's actually getting hold of them um, and also being able to do this. But this was the challenge we sort of set ourselves as finding and talking to MOOC takers some time after the event, either a few months and a few years after the course experiences to see what, what actual values um, would, did they think, what value did they get from the experience? So we have um, some findings. Um, 
Yeah. And, and I'm going to hand over to Tasneem to talk through um, some of the um, findings of values, but they are a, 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 um, against four themes. So one value is around knowledge. A second is around professional development as a value. And we have um, granular kind of subconstructs for professional development. Um, Self-improvement was another um, value and outcome. And then we had a fourth value that came out, which was really around value of MOOCs in general. And now the next section is really going to be for us to share some of the voices of, um, of these people from the set, data set. So I'll hand over to Tessie. Cool. The first one is gaining knowledge. So it sounds quite simplistic and it actually is that. So when we think about knowledge and people doing MOOCs, um, we want evidence that they've, they've learned what their motivations are for joining the course. So most of our data set had some sort of quote or example that indicated that they had did something. So this is Gina in the age range of 18 to 24 from South Africa. She said it helped me to understand about the link between development and climate change and also helped me realize what a big problem climate change is. So the course she did was about climate change mitigation. And what this quote tells us is that this evidence that she had learned something. So many of our other cases or interviews we had all had similar scenarios where there was evidence that they gain some form of knowledge. Okay, the next one's professional development. And this is about uh, people indicating that the MOOC had some sort of impact on their job or career, possible change of career, filling in a skills gap, um, perhaps they needed it for their job. So you'll notice some overlap between um, the categories and that's because we're also still working on them and refining them as we go along. So if you have any input on this, um, please feel free to use the chat room. So the first one is skills development, and this is about um, a learner identifying that they have a skill gap and doing something about it. In this case, it would be um, doing a MOOC. I just need to, can I move this? Sorry guys, I'm way in the way. Um, so um, Timby, a pathologist from South Africa did a course on understanding clinical research. So in that course, they were taught how to in interpret medical literature, um, uh, the statistics of medical literature in a way that doesn't use lots of numbers. It's, quite, it's one of our most popular courses and it's evident from uh, the feedback and the interviews we've done. So Timby said, I really believe I needed to understand how to summarize data and how to interpret data. So that's what motivated her to, to, to take the course, but now she's able to use that course where she's working. So it served a specific need and a gap in her um, knowledge. Another one is credibility. So a no, no, no. A big thing about yeah. MOOCs are with the, um, what credibility does it offer? I hear something speaking. Um, what could credibility does MOOCs offer or do MOOCs offer? Because MOOCs are not accredited. But from our interviews, we can tell that people definitely found value in getting the certificate and putting it on their CV or putting it on their LinkedIn. And whether it's an application for their job or studies, it, for them, it was evidence that they could use for an employer. So... Gina said, I do think that employers like to see students having done things outside of their department. And um, having it on a CV thought it might be good to branch into other areas. So especially when people um, have done a degree in university and late in life they decide they want to uh, go down a different pathway, then they would maybe perhaps do a MOOC and add that to their CV. And it shows the employer they're interested in another field and they have done something related to that field. Improving current practice is about improving the current ways of working. So, um, Ocheng in from Uganda said uh, he works with uh, let's see, he works with communities having unique problems. So we need to, to get some unique solutions that are tailored. So this course in particular helped him thinking through community problems and see how to find solutions. Okay. I think someone has their mic on, um, but all good. Uh, the next one's practical application where uh, a person states that they were able to use their knowledge. There is a level of overlap, but 
we will refine that as we go along. So Matthew from Cameroon said he used the knowledge at a level of school and is able to carry out some modif modifications to the school thanks to the knowledge gained in the course Education for All. Um, so Education for All teaches about, um, yes, about inclusive education and catering to all people. So uh, Matthew um, taught in a school where there are lots of, where there are wheel wheelchair users and was able to use the knowledge apart from the course to um, cater to uh, improving the environment for those users. So meet specific needs about um, where a specific challenge was addressed. So Rue from South Africa, he did the Becoming a Change Maker course, which was about social entrepreneurship and developing solutions for social problems. And Rue did this because he joined a new company and one of the tasks they gave him was to sustain grassroots organizations. And he knew he needed more information. So he took the course for that specific reason. So we also had, um, although professional um, development was, I think, probably the most um, cited value in the in the data set, and that's not surprising given that most people were in work and were in a kind of career um, stage of their lives where they were working. Um, we also, had, um, as as is in the kind of broader MOOC literature, people just working uh, through MOOCs for self-improvement and for self-interest. But we had a few kind of interesting stories coming out here as well. And one of them in terms of self-improvement was this kind of notion that you could um, do a course and you sort of invest in yourself for a potential future change. Um, and that's something that was quite interesting and came out a few times. So where, so this is where the skills that you have might have value at some point in the future. And so Anna um, from South Africa, who was part of the um, Becoming a Change Maker Social Innovation course says here, I wanted to just beef up my CV. I wanted to reach out into other areas because I'm in academic literacy and I study linguistics. I wanted to go into something a little bit different. So that was the first reason. This is her talking about her reasons for um, working through the MOOC. Um, another um, interesting kind of um, proxy for self-improvement almost was around where people talked, uh, quite a few people talked about encouraging others to take the course that they had taken as a form of self-improvement for others. Um, and this, and, and there were some people who just said things like, yes, it was such a useful thing, I told my work colleagues. But there were a couple of interesting things where people almost used it as a diagnostic for colleagues. And this was fascinating. So and Mabel here, um, who is based in South Africa, also um, took the um, Change Maker course, says, um, I think because of the design emphasis, so she's referring to an element of the course, I learn new stuff and I also ask quite a few people that I work with to enroll. So I used it almost like a tool to make an assessment of the person who was participating and completing. And she goes on to say things like, could they complete the course? Could they do it on time? Um, mm -hmm. In a sense, she was almost encouraging other people to take it because she was sort of, you know, testing them or seeing whether they could do it in the way she had. And that was quite a sort of interesting um, lens of um, self-improvement as part of the value that she felt people would get out of um, doing the course. Um, another one around self-improvement is around networks and expanding networking. And this was on, often related to the, um, the course, you know, very much related to the course topic and even the educators who were offering the course. And this is a, a longer story and I won't read it all out, but this is Yasin from South Africa who said through this course, he was exposed to a particular um, institute at the Graduate School of Business. <laughs> who offered this course and that he then became involved in a conference um, or event that they run um, and it was through that that he was able to expand his network and um, and and be able to um, interact in that sense so networking um, was something that um, was a kind of uh, again a, another form of sort of self-improvement um, and then the, a, a, a kind of common one, I suppose, around self-improvement is social engagement, um, where people were able to, um, through um, interaction with the course, um, kind of 
um, enter the community, at least have some of the language and the knowledge to have discussions around the topic that they were interested in. And in this case, this is Fashola from Nigeria, who says, it's an av relating to the course, it is an avenue for me to really commence with, um, with my other colleagues around the globe, um, in South Africa, US, the UK. It shows that in spite of your location as regards physiotherapy, and he refers to Nigeria happens to be a limited resource country as regards physiotherapy. So taking MOOCs helped me know the trends in the world. Um, and I have the opportunity to interact with other people to share ideas. So again, that was around self social engagement. Um, so that's a kind of very quick kind of um, canter through really some of the um, sort of values um, and, and high level categories. And then there was one that we also coded for, which was we were trying to get People to um, people often spoke about um, the MOOC movement and and the general value of it. And this is a kind of couple of typical comments um, around that in terms of just um, being useful, um, not just the specific course. There's um, Seppo from Lesotho who's saying, you know, the value of MOOCs for us who are fully employed, you wouldn't have time to go to school every day. But with the MOOCs, you're able to sit at your place and learn and acquire new skills. So they have been of great importance. And then Walters from Zambia um, expands on this and says, I guess it's for the same reason as to why I took them. Um, like it's good for you in the long run, good prospects, improve your prospects. So here you can see some of that kind of future investment coming in. Hopefully there's something new helps you improve and advance your career. And these were kind of, um, you know, fairly common um, it, for people who were, you know, we, we found quite a lot of serial MOOCers in the data set, people who just took lots, lots and lots of courses, um, and, and that came out. Okay, so I think we're doing quite well for time. Before we go on the conclusions, Jeff and Tasneem, do you want to add anything to this? Okay. So, um, we'll, we'll talk through some of the conclusions, then we can go to questions. So. Where we are in the project is um, really our intention was to move um, the conversation, at least for us, beyond a kind of deficit model. Yes, we are very aware um, of the um, critiques around MOOCs, um, that um, they um, are particularly um, advantageous to perhaps those who least need the advantage. Um, um, they are mainly taken by people, if you think about it on a global level, in the global north, people are um, employed, educated, so you know, what difference is this actually making? And we also know that the um, people, you know, most people do not complete MOOCs, that the completion rates are between five and 10%. So we kind of understand that we were, um, that is, that is a kind of broader environment. What we wanted to do in this particular project was to focus on um, a group that perhaps are under-researched, their stories are not um, very, they don't come out very much in the, in the research. These are, you could say, um, people who are, who are marginalized because of their geographic location. Um, they are taking MOOCs from a, a, a African institution. So these were MOOCs um, offered by the University of Cape Town. Um, it's one of the few institutions that offers MOOCs on global platforms. And so we were interested in, you know, what, what's happening here in this space. So we wanted to move beyond that deficit model. And we did find that, MOOC, that our, the MOOC takers were typically employed, well-educated in our set, but they often spoke of being marginalized for all sorts of different reasons, including access, geographic location, their opportunities and current access to further study, even if they had a first degree. And often they were not easily able to study further formally. And so for them, these MOOCs made you know, a difference. And we were really interested in what difference that made. So um, just to sum up the types of value that people talked about, um, there was, as expected, sort of pro immediate professional development advantages across all those different um, things that we described, like skills development or, um, you know, immediate practical application. We also had people who were um, interested in the professional development opportunities, but that they it was deferred or banked, perhaps, and then that was also around credibility and having the certificate was really quite important. And people spoke of you know, paying for the certificate or applying for financial aid to get the certificates. So that was something that was important. And then self-improvement um, in various ways. And then we got a, um, quite a few um, people who, uh, who just loved 
doing MOOCs as lifelong learners, didn't have a particular purpose necessarily. And that's, and they tended to be perhaps older in retirement, um, and, and that also came out. So in terms of um, considerations of where does this take us, well, we're quite still early on. Uh, we've just uh, started writing some um, papers at the moment. Um, is that this really leads us to consider the value of non-accredited courses and open online learning and, and what that, how that can serve diverse groups of, of people and what an institution like ours, um, you know, we've gone ahead with this MOOC project, uh, you know, we've, it's, it's, it's you know, it's a way for us to reflect and see where, it, where um, what kind of students are interested in who it's serving. And I suppose for us in all this kind of, um, you know, critiques is that there, there's also been quite a lot of hope and optimism that mm -hmm. when we read the stories of these people, um, especially when they're encouraging others to be part of it. So I think for us, um, that's the space that we're in. We don't have any firm conclusions as yet because this is a kind of work in progress. If you want to add, colleagues want to add anything, mm. and otherwise we can go back to the the group. Okay, so thank you. That's <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, just wanted to show the last slide. Um, uh, just give me a sec. Okay, and that's the team there. <laughs> so just yeah, sorry, I almost forgot the last team. So that's. That's us, and uh, we know some of you, and you know some of us, but uh, yeah, we'd love for you to get in touch and um, talk to us, whatever. Thanks very much, and thanks Emerge for giving us the opportunity to um, share this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can I hand back over to you, Jakob? Yes, certainly. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm not sure how much you can actually, uh, now that your slides are off, if you can actually access the... Um, yes, I'm the, frantically the scanning the chat. <laughs> some of the, um, some of the um, questions. I see there's a question from uh, Nicola Pellet about um, the, the, the relevance, not just for MOOCs. I don't know if, if uh, Nicola, you want to, to ask that in uh, question in voice, if you're able to. Can you start on the top of the questions? No. We're just going to scroll to the chat and look for questions to answer. I guess, first of all, hello, everyone. We'll say hi back to you. Sorry, we missed <laughs> Yeah. All right. Uh, what, what, what Nicola, just to relay that question from Nicola, maybe she's on, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, Nicola's asking, like, wondering, uh, or more, maybe more commenting, wondering about the relevance, not just for MOOCs, but online courses and online professional development opportunities, folks, uh, across the country, oh, yeah. generally. Um, MOOCs seems to be a great way to collect these stories, maybe drawing from that question, uh, how do you see your research in relating to um, to, to more, more like online courses and other kinds of online activities. So are we talking specifically about non-accredited courses or just in no, general? Just general. Mm -hmm. Jeff's going to take this. Nicola, one. hi, it's Jeff here. Thanks for the question. <clears throat> Can you hear us properly? Can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, Nicola, hi. I think what's been very interesting with this um, research project is that listening to the, to the voices and stories of people who are doing MOOCs, um, it means that those people are doing other things as well. Sure, some of them are only doing non-accredited, but others are doing accredited studies both face-to-face -face as well as some online. And they're reflecting on their experiences across those, those, those different spaces, those different modes. Um, we were we, we, the, the the struggles they have with the online mode um, apply both to MOOCs and to non MOOC um, sites that they're working across. So many of the stories and, and aspects of what 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 they're doing um, are relevant around our considering I mean, embarking on 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 the development and design of online courses and other online programs, not necessarily MOOCs alone. So we found that it, it was very relevant. The other exciting part was that. Often we, 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 we have certain stereotypes about how people in, in distant and remote rural areas or even very large cities in, 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 in parts of Africa, what 
what they deal with, um, the kinds of, of, of challenges they have. And this helped to open a little bit of that box. Um, there's, there's a, obviously, there's a lot more that we have to find out and, and learn. But, uh, you know, uh, my colleagues and I have really benefited from being able to listen to these stories from places that we haven't otherwise been able to hear. I don't know if anybody, any of the other of the team would like to add. No, I mean, just to say one of, you know, one of the, the goals of this project was to inform um, different types mm. of um, online courses, both from a kind of topics and, and what people wanted um, from them. Um, but, you know, MOOCs are different from formal online courses as well. So we were also trying to understand what this kind of in-between space of MOOCs mean for people, you know, how are they valued in relation to possibly other types of um, professional development or educational opportunities. Does that answer your question, Nicola? Okay. Um, in, in our notes, oh. Um, someone's asking what are the average number of students in the MOOCs? That's quite a tricky question. I don't know if you um, a... So some of our oh, can we share that one? Well we yeah, sure. I mean well, maybe while you get the numbers. But, so yeah. um, our earlier MOOCs that we launched probably in twenty fourteen are a lot bigger than the courses we've launched recently. And I think that's as a result of um, saturation of a saturation of MOOC over time, a lot more universities jumped on board and there are thousands of courses available and you'll get multiple courses on the same topic. So, so over the years, I think the numbers have decreased a bit, but uh, for example, I think one of our courses is over 50,000 enrollments or more than one of them. Um, but the smaller courses that we've launched recently are maybe still in the thousands, the smaller yeah. thousands. Okay. Somebody is asked, can anyone direct me to a paper on why universities are using blended MOOCs? Oh, well, we should direct you to your emerging paper. <laughs> <Name and Jeff. laughs> we are uh, busy on a paper that's, uh, that deals with how academics have been using the MOOCs in their programs on campus. Um, but we're still busy with that. But we do have other literature, and I've shared our, our research page with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Moxus Entertainment. Oh yes, Nicola's referring to that Tasneem's and Co's paper on wrapped MOOCs that we presented last year. So I think that uh, oh, that's another paper. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, Maha is saying I don't understand the consideration of non-accredited courses meaning more. Um, I I think it was. I think maybe it's. Maybe I'm, I didn't phrase that correctly. I think what we were saying is we're just interested in considering that these courses um, or MOOCs don't, are not credit bearing. Um, and that if people do get a certificate, in a way, it's almost what do they, what does, what did they, what a meaning do they ascribe to the certificate itself? So, um, so that was interesting for us because, yes, the certificate is from, say, the University of Cape Town. So that meant something for some people. But depending on the topic, I mean, it, it's not like having a, a degree with a transcript. So in that sense, they're non-accredited. And we were just interested in the kinds of meaning that people ascribed themselves um, and also sometimes spoke about... Um, something happening because they had certificates or you know either they got a job interview or they were they managed to get a consulting job or something like that and it was just interesting because that's one of the business models of MOOCs is is the certificates and we were just interested in kind of seeing whether there was any kind of match between that and whether there was any evidence that people were starting to use these um so MOOCs. Lost audio. have we lost the audio are we fine? Yeah. Mm. Um, so I think that's that was our interest area around considering these as non-accredited um, education, you know, courses. Um, uh, although people's understanding of that also quite, you know, varied. Uh, and remember, our data set were people who completed, and many of them, because they completed, 
um, you know, a high, relatively high proportion actually made an effort to get a certificate and for them it meant something. Um, we had lots of references to people putting it on LinkedIn and it acted as a signaling of some sort. The nature of the signaling um, was really the meaning that they ascribed to it themselves. Um, okay. Um, I'm just going down. Sorry, I don't know if I'm going to. No, I am. That's one about using Rappen. Okay, so I'm going to just read um, Harriet's um, comment. We've just wrapped one of our MOOCs for on campus use. So I think these are colleagues of BITS. To ease, ease of access for registered students, we rebuilt the MOOC in Sakai, learned quite a few valuable lessons for how to design in Sakai for access by mobile device. Um, we have found quite a few participants use mobile devices to access MOOCs. Maybe Sakai 12 would be better at responsiveness to various screen sites. Okay, that's, um, I'm not sure if there's a question there, but thanks for sharing that. Uh, we, okay, it sounds like the mobile um, device was possible issue um, for that. Um, so people sharing some nice comments in that, okay. How can MOOCs be used in refugees situation in terms of licenses? Um, does licenses mean certificates? Um, I don't know. Do, does was it maybe the Creative Commons? Yeah, yes. maybe. And um, I'm more border. Can you uh, maybe add something about how can MOOCs be used in refugee situation in terms of licenses? I mean, while you do that, I'll just say that there is quite um, a lot of case studies in literature about. Um, MOOCs and um, educational opportunities for refugees globally. And there are quite a few organizations working on that. And Coursera also has a program for um, refugee education. Um, so that is something that you might want to um, look up. Okay. Um, oh, um, are your certificates free for all, free for some who can't afford? So um, that's the question from Maha. So this, we host um, with Futureland and Coursera and they both have tables. Um, so what we have is um, on, on Futureland, um, the courses are free for audit, um, but if you want to have persistent access to the course or um, have a certificate of accomplishment or a certificate of uh, um, then you have to pay, but you can do the course um, in audit mode, which is review the materials and work through it for free. On Coursera, um, there's a few different models, mm -hmm. but effectively you can audit all our courses. Um, uh, that means access the courses, enroll, um, and you would have to pay for the certificate. However, Coursera's um, financial aid is mm. actually very generous mm. and we encourage people to do that. And um, the last figures we had from Coursera is that they get something like seven times more um, applications from um, developing country uh, learners than developed country learners for financial aid. And there is a financial aid like, you know, you have to complete a form um, and it, 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 there's a two week waiting period. But um, as far as I know, that is working quite well. And we, we encourage people to apply for financial aid. Um, on and those. I think a lot of our learners from sort of developing nations are utilizing yeah. financial aid, which we are quite happy about. So we always promote financial aid. Um, because we want to share that knowledge and if it helps people gain a skill, they can use it for an employer or apply for something, then we've yeah. sort of done our job. Yeah. Okay, so um, hopefully that's um, answered it. Um, thank you everyone for sort of sharing. Okay, so I think, think we've, we've come to the bottom of those questions um, around, and there's a few people talking about financial aid. Um, yeah, I don't know if our colleagues from VITS want to share any um, any insights on the on the weekend on the mic as well. There's some very interesting things happening there. Um, otherwise, if anyone else wants to pop any questions in, okay. Yeah, I I have to say I think you guys are, in terms of researching the the impact of the MOOCs are probably a little bit ahead of us. Um, <laughs> our, our team is a little bit small at the moment, so 
we don't get to to delving into the yep. data. But uh, as I mentioned in in the chat, so we've we've learned some lessons, and and we use only edX. We don't have different different platforms like like you do. So what we've been playing a lot with is kind of extending the the tool set inside of edX with kind of developing stuff and putting it on a in the cloud somewhere and thinking to it. And so we've been playing with with funny things like that. Um, our target market is also mainly into Africa, I think, and, and I guess the, the the reasons why people access them would be fairly similar. Yeah. Um, in in terms of our, our approach to building MOOCs, at first we were kind of trying to get people to play with us, so um, we'd get people who were interested in, in, in building MOOCs and we'd just build MOOCs for them without really thinking too much about what the impact would be on those mm -hmm. MOOCs. Mm -hmm. And as we go along, we're trying to get better at, at choosing um, the, the the topic that's covered by the MOOC type of thing. To um, yeah, we're never going to make money out of this. Mm. So to try and find out, okay, so if we're not going to make money, what other value can we get out of this? So we're learning a lot about you know stickability of course design. How do we design to to, to get people to compete, and how can we move away from video heavy to to inter to engagement with with content um, we we kind of trying to move away from head and shoulders videos into into really engaging with content we had one really nice one that we did where we created a country and a newspaper and a government system it, it was about um, monitoring and evaluation so we both, okay. we, uh, we kind of built a, a a case study using maps that we designed of an of, of a um, that's like a mock mock country because we didn't want to use one specific country because then it brings all kinds of other issues into it. And so that was quite an interesting approach that we had to the to the MOOC. And at first we had some challenges around people being able to navigate through the course, and we found people started off with a course and right in the middle of it people started dropping out so we knew there was something wrong with that yeah. course at that point in time and we we went in you know, I say we it's not me that the, the team went into that and they, they identified what the problem was and they fixed it and so that course is run a lot better we we starting off on our first collaborative MOOC now with other um, universities so it will probably be CPUT and TUT and UP and a couple of people working on an architecture course and around um, just getting people informed of what the career is all about. Um, and so that will probably be the, the first step in it. I'd actually like for us to see how what we can do with a MOOC to improve access to the career. So in the same way as CPUT is not, well, they've done the, it's going to be an advanced certificate now, I think, where, where they do that mostly online with a few contact sessions to have that kind of a, a, a mood perhaps but looking at entry into the career you know so people that hasn't got the prerequisite knowledge skill sets type of things and getting that into a MOOC so that it enables access into the into the career so maybe we want to play in that area so we're trying different things um, and we have started wrapping quite a quite a bit more um, we try and trying to do that and we've actually had other universities from overseas kind of including our MOOCs into their formal courses so a lot of that is happening um, yeah. Great. thank you thanks for sharing that um, we've got a couple of questions um, and just a few more minutes um, do you want to read that one out to Steve? Um, so so we have a question here about the use of MOOCs for refugees can a developer or instructional designer integrate with MOOCs and issue licenses or some some MOOCs can be done to a device. Um, are there two, is, is this a Creative Commons and just, I'm just trying to figure out what the question is exactly asking. So I think if this is, can the content be reused on another platform? Um, it depends on the, you know, the MOOC and the institution mm -hmm. and the terms. Um, one of the things we didn't mention, um, but most, of our MOOCs, all of our, all MOOCs. of our MOOCs, sorry, um, are are 
um, the materials are under Creative Commons licenses, and that's a decision we made quite early on. And we have you know, managed to maintain that. It's not mandatory, so people who work with us, like um, the academics, you know, they could choose not to, but we've encouraged that, and that has paid dividends, I think, in terms of reuse. And we have had people take the materials and use them in all sorts of ways. And we had a project, a research project for a while, sort of looking into that as well. Um, so that, that really, in answer to that question, depends really on the, ter you know, the terms of the institution, whether someone can take the materials. The other issue is mm -hmm. a kind of technical issue. Um, so we build the, the MOOCs onto, in our case, the Future Learning Coursera platforms. So people can download individual materials, but we don't have like a course container that just, yeah. um, you know, takes the whole course and puts it into another platform. Well, we don't have so we that have, mechanism. Mm -hmm. So there would be a technical barrier, I imagine, to being able to do that, even if the licensing was not an issue yeah so if yeah. people who use it they probably just download um it's individual it, yeah i have yeah. had people contact us for for example for the social innovation course i have had people say they want to use the videos or something and then i've repackaged the videos for them specifically um, but we, we don't share an entire course like in a zip file where people can download everything yeah um, we're in the process actually of, um, at the moment, people can go into the course and do what they want. We're in the process of actually having um, an, inter an institutional interface where all our MOOCs mm -hmm. will be off the platforms. Um, and then they'll be hosted on, um, probably through our library separately, all the materials. So people can just go straight to that and get the materials. We haven't been able to do that just for good technical issues in terms of our infrastructure being able to host video um, but we're getting close to doing that as well um, okay repository no. we don't use a repository to upload our video um, well we're trying to organize that yeah now. but at the yeah. moment at yes. the moment everything's directly hosted on the platforms yeah. and we don't have an external website or source where you can access the materials otherwise yeah I mean that's the current current yes. ongoing project. When we first did the MOOCs project, um, Open UCT, which is our institutional repository for OER, wasn't able to take video. And so that's why um, we weren't able to do that um, at that time. Okay. All right, we've got just a few minutes to go. So can I hand back over to you, Jakob? And uh, thank you everyone for your questions and insights. Um, it's really nice to have everybody um, in the chat and in the session.